this is where we have stopped. We have introduced Pockel cell which is an electro optic modulator. Remember earlier we have talked about acousto optic modulator AOM as they are called in short. These are called EOM. So, henceforth you should not get scared or confused if people throw these acronyms at you. AOM, EOM you know what they are. Now, we know how it works and we know that our ultimate goal is to obtain Q switching by using a Pockel cell. If you understood these two, the rest is not very difficult to understand. We will just introduce one more term uh, that is Brewster angle. Again, this discussion is completely from Silva's book. The book that we have been using uh, so far, I find that uh, discussion of Pockel cell is a little easier and qualitative in Silva's book. In fact, uh, right after this discussion in the same book, you do have a detailed uh, mathematical discussion of the theory. If you are interested, you are welcome to study. But we can develop a qualitative understanding at least from what we are saying. So, this here is a cavity. I have forgotten to uh, write which one is output coupler, so I will tell you. The mirror that is blacker we are saying that is the high reflector. This one that is less black that is the output coupler. So, if you ignore, if you can ignore this Pockel cell in the between for now, you can think it is a very simple laser cavity right. You have a gain medium which they have written amplifier, do not get confused with this between this amplifier and the amplifier used in our lab, it is just gain medium. And you might see that this gain medium is shown in a little strange shape. It is not, the cross section is not a square, it is a trapezium. That is because, in fact, all gain media are kept or cut in this case at what is called Brewster angle. A Brewster angle is such that if the surface is at Brewster angle, then a particular polarization will be sustained, everything else will be reflected. Okay? And you see, uh, in a minute, a few minutes, how that becomes useful. Are we clear about the cavity? And in the middle of it, we have introduced a Pockel cell. All right. So, let us see how Q switching is done in this case. For the moment, let us think this is a CW laser. At the end of the discussion, we will also mention, unfortunately, I have not drawn that diagram, but I think you will be able to understand we will say what happens if this is a mode lock laser. I can put in a mode locker here can not I? Yeah? Or it can be a uh, this amplifier uh, gain medium that can be a tie sapphire, sapphire crystal can not it be. So, uh, it can be CW can be mode lock does not matter f f uh, to start with let us say this is a CW laser. All right? Now, the way it works is this you apply the voltage to Pockel cell and you use a Pockel cell and use a voltage in such a way that polarization of light going in is rotated by 45 degrees. This is a very uh, nice trick that is used uh, ubiquitously uh, in uh, especially ultrafast spectroscopy. Right? So, the moment a beam of light passes through, if it is linearly polarized, the plane of polarization will be rotated not by 90 degrees, but by 45 degrees. Okay? So, let us say we have plane polarized light like this, vertically polarized light okay? and Pockel cell is powered, voltage is on. So, now when this light passes through, when it emerges, what will be the polarization? it will be rotated by 45 degrees. So, well it is not so easy to draw a three dimensional diagram on two dimensional uh, surface. So, please imagine that this tilted arrow means 45 degree ro rotation of polarization. Okay? Now, this goes hits the output coupler comes back and passes through Pockel cell again. 
I hope you agree with me that when it passes through Pockel cell again, once again it will be rotated by 45 degrees and the light that now emerges is at 90 degrees. Right? You started with vertical polarization. After a round trip through the Pockel cell, polarization is now horizontal. Uh, this meaning of this donut is that this arrow, one of the arrowheads is pointing towards you. In the later diagrams, I have used a different kind of donut. Okay, all right. Now, don't forget that this amplifier or gain medium surface is cut at Brewster angle. And what did we say? It is only going to sustain one kind of uh, polarization, in this case, vertical polarization. So, what happens when this horizontally polarized light goes further and impinges upon? that surface of the amplifier or gain medium, it will not be allowed to enter, right? it will get reflected. So, it is no longer there. So, as long as the voltage is on, the cavity is not there. right? So, we have been able to satisfy the initial part in the scheme that we had drawn a little earlier. Right, this is a high loss cavity and you can actually have controlled loss in this medium, you maintain it as high loss and then start pumping. As you pump, the uh, population of the uh, higher energy level keeps increasing and all. Then what you do is after an appropriate time, switch the voltage off. The moment you switch the voltage off, Pockel cell is now, if I can borrow uh, terminology from our eminent inorganic chemistry colleagues, it is an innocent piece of optic. Until now, it was non-innocent. It was doing things to the polarization of the light. Now, it is not. So, since it is now innocent, what will happen is vertically polarized light will pass through without change in polarization, hit the mirror, come back, pass again, nothing happens, goes through the amplifier. Now, the cavity is on. right? And after a few round trips, what will happen is threshold will be exceeded and light comes out like as a pulse. Okay? This is Q switched operation. And at that moment, you are so engrossed at looking at the colorful light pulse, you did not notice that there was another arrow that came up, voltage is switched on, which means the cavity is not there again. Okay? So, you understand there is a lot of electronics involved here precise timing is required and that is what limits the uh, kind of pulse that you can get by using Q switching. As we have discussed when we, we talked about TCSPC earlier, uh, electron, all electronic components have their response time. Right? So, you'll, it will be impossible for you to keep this cavity on only for a few femtoseconds. It works best for nanosecond actually. Hundreds of picosecond maybe yes. Anything less than that, if you want a really 10 picosecond, tens of picoseconds laser, you use mode locking, not Q switching. Femtosecond laser, forget about it. But you will see how Q switching is important in femtosecond laser technology as well. We will come to that. But this is how you can produce a uh, giant pulse of light using Pockel cell as a Q switch. You understood? Now, let me ask a question. Well, let me remind you the question we asked. All this time we were saying that this is a CW laser, right? Suppose this is a mode locked laser, then what will happen? Pockel cell voltage is off for say 100 nanoseconds or something. And let us say this is a titanium sapphire laser. So, some pulses will come in that hundreds of nanoseconds. What is the separation in time between two successive pulses of uh, a tie sapphire laser? 12.2 nanosecond. So, if this Pockel cell is open for 100 nanosecond, there will be something like 10 pulses there. So, the output will be a giant pulse made up of small pulses, right? short pulses. Will it be a square pulse or will it be something like a Gaussian 
envelope. You understand what I am saying, right? When the light goes out, what goes out is whatever number of pulses are produced in that 100 nanosecond, right? Pulses are 100 femtosecond or smaller. What will the output look like? Will it be, if it is a uh, CW pulse, output as a function of time is Gaussian. It is just that full width half maximum is nanosecond and not femtosecond. But if you have a mode locked Ti sapphire or alexandrite or some such laser, which is in any case producing uh, femtosecond pulses at 80 megahertz, then within that 100 nanosecond, 10 pulses will come. What I am asking is, will the pulses be all the same in intensity or will it be something like going up and going down? It will not be same. Because what happens is, when it is coming, even then it is doing round trips, right? So, there will be an increase in energy and then eventually loss will take over. So, then intensity will fall. This is something that is important in what we are going to discuss next, sharp pulse amplification. And this, this is something that uh, we have seen now in our lab also. If you look at that uh, oscilloscope, you see some pulses, right? And then when you switch it off, you do not see half of it. So, that is what it is. Train of pulses. And then one can think about applications like pulse shaping, if you understand this. All right? So far, so good. Now, to are pockel cells the only things that can be used for Q switching? No. You can use our old friend acousto-optic modulators as well. Not very difficult to understand. Use a Bragg cell, right? Any emission that comes will be sent off axis by the Bragg cell most of the time. And then it will, so you can uh, use a suitable frequency of sound. Whenever it is favorable, the cavity will be switched on. So, you can do Q switching by AOMs as well. EOMs are more popular actually. Since we are talking about EOMs, let us not stop only at Q switching. Let us talk about another application which might sound uh, very similar. After all, I mean, things are. Uh, basic principles are the same, right? It is what kind of linear combination of the things you take that determines what your application is. So far, we have seen how a pockel cell can be used for Q switching, getting a giant pulse out of a laser. Now, let us discuss very briefly how a pockel cell and a thin film polarizer combination can be used to sw switch uh, or steer a beam in uh, direction that we want. Once again, this is going to come useful in the next discussion and the discussion we are going to have in the next module, chart pulse amplification. So, here uh, remember earlier what worked was, if it was only a pockel cell, it would not have worked. Pockel cell could act as a Q switch because along with it, you also used a gain medium at Brewster angle. So, it is a die laser, we talked about die jets the other day. The die jets were never like this, if this is the mirror, they are always at Brewster angle. Brewster angle is extremely important in all kinds of laser application, because you are dealing with polarized light. So, here what you do is, you use a combination of a pockel cell and a thin film polarizer. Has anybody ever seen a thin film polarizer? Is anybody into photography at all? Somebody has a good camera? How good a camera? I mean, camera is as good as it is, but how uh, enthusiastic are you? Do you use external filters and all or with your camera? Okay. So, if you are more of an enthusiast, what you will do is, you will like to get the best possible picture. And very often, you will see uh, photographs in which the sky is blue. Uh, sounds foolish, but I mean, uh, it is blue like it is usually not 
to our naked eyes. Some filter has been used, right? Very often you will see cameramen using filters which are colorless. Sometimes they are UV filters, sometimes they are polarizers. Whenever we say polarizer, especially chemists, we think of that Canada balsam and uh, whatever, we, we think of a nice cube which has been cut from, uh, cut diagonally and uh, glued together and all that, right? It is not necessary that always you have to have cube polarizers. You can have plate polarizers as well. So, thin plates, they are called thin film polarizer, right? In fact, the polarizers that we use in our TCSPC, they are basically plates, isn't it? So, something like that. So, what you do is, you, uh, right now we are not uh, bothered about where exactly the end mirrors are and all. Here we have a focal cell and here we have a polarizer and voltage is off. If you have a polarizer, then it will allow either vertically polarized light to go through it or horizontally polarized light to it and like to go through it depending on what kind of orientation of polarizer, polarizer you have taken, right? Let us say we work with uh, vertically polarized light, voltage is off, it goes through and then your polarizer is aligned. So, without any hassle light goes through and very typically it will, this will, the apparatus will be inside the cavity of a laser, we will discuss in uh, next modules in a little more detail, okay? So, do you understand? If the voltage is off, then a vertically polarized light will go through this and well, one thing I should say is that uh, this uh, thin film polarizer is kept at an angle to the direction of propagation of the laser. Very typically, it is kept at 45 degrees, okay? So, we have already shown you what happens with this combination of focal cell and TFP kept at 45 degrees or whatever degrees for a vertically polarized light, it goes through, right? It depends on our requirement. I am only taking an example. You might want the horizontally polarized light to go through, then you choose the orientation of polarizer accordingly, all right? Now, what happens when without changing this uh, apparatus, right? Which means thin film polarizer is set so that vertically polarized light will go through. I apply a voltage. And I, now, this time I apply a voltage in such a way that polarization is rotated not by 45 degrees, but by 90 degrees. It is in my hand. For a given focal cell, you can do actually whatever you want. Now, what will happen? Vertically polarized light comes. When it goes through, it becomes horizontally polarized, hits this and gets reflected. Right? So, whenever I want the light to come in this direction, I switch the voltage on for whatever duration I want. Whenever I want it to go straight, I will switch it off. Okay? So, this is a very efficient way in which you can switch a, an external beam into another laser cavity or switch the output from there. All right? Now, let us think a little bit. Uh, we had said that we get giant pulses out of Q-switch lasers, right? That is because we keep it on for some time, at least some tens of nanoseconds or something. Let us say I have a good focal cell, which I can accurately control with a precision of say 5 nanosecond, not impossible, 3 nanosecond, let us say 5 nanosecond, which means I can have a fairly square pulse in that time scale. And let us say that this horizontally polar, vertically polarized light that we are talking about, that is from a femtosecond laser. Okay? So, femtosecond laser gives a train of pulses, all same intensity. And if it is an oscillator, your uh, separation between two pulses is 12.2 nanosecond. What I say is, I will switch on the voltage only for 5 nanosecond and then switch it off for some time. Understood what I am saying? 
what kind of output will I get in that direction in this direction. Yes, but okay, let us go in steps, you will get a pulse. Will the uh, pulse width change? No, no, but repetition rate will change, right. And in fact, if I want, I can switch out one single pulse, right. I keep it on for 5 nanosecond, I mean, yeah, and then switch it off. So, anything that comes out, so in 5 nanosecond, how many pulses can come if you are dealing with a uh, tie sapphire oscillator only one because the next pulse is 12 nanosecond away. So, it is like a gate that opens for some time, but uh, the timing is such that maybe one person walks through. So, Q in Q switch what we had is uh, it is like a it is like opening the gate uh, of some office building at uh, the beginning of office hour or end of office hour for that matter lot of people rush through right and this one is like you open in the middle of the night one person is there he walks out. So, beam steering and beam switching in an out of cavity that is where Q switches actually find application. We might think that why are we even talking about Q switches because we are interested in ultra fast this is not ultra fast it does have application as we will see and the application is in something called chaffed pulse amplification. Know this people? Arthur Ashkin, Gerard Muro, Donna Strickland. The names ring a bell. Who are they? They got the Nobel Prize, right? When? Yeah, last year, 2018. Nobel Prize in Physics, it was split into two half of it went to Arthur Ashkin. What did Ashkin get it for? He got it for something called laser tweezers micro manipulation. And Muru and uh, Strickland got it for chopped pulse amplification, a technology that is used in all ultra fast labs worldwide now. Okay. And that is based on what we have discussed so far. So, uh, what we have done is we have talked about how to produce short pulses from ultra short to not so ultra short. We have talked about how to uh, modulate the uh, repetition rate of the output by cavity dumping and then by Q switching. And then now we are going back to a domain of ultra fast lasers where we learn how to amplify a pulse using all this and maybe a little more. Okay, that is what we will do in the next module. This is how you do it. Of course, we will discuss it in detail in the next one, but today let us at least uh, give you a preview. What happens is I hope this is something that uh, you know now what this means it is electric field right electric field versus time plot for a pulse. And you have a pulse from an oscillator and you want to amplify it. You amplify it by switching the pulse in using a Q switch into the cavity of another laser. Again, the second laser has no output coupler, only two high reflectors and there it gets amplified. How it gets amplified? We will learn in the next module. But the problem is this, you people calculated a few weeks ago how much of energy there is per pulse if you are talking about is really small pulse. So, so much of light introduced into another laser is going to destroy the optics. And then you use a very neat trick and the trick is converting a difficulty into an advantage. When we talked about construction of a uh, tie sapphire laser, we have talked about chirping right that when uh, an ultra short pulse goes through some medium red light goes ahead and blue light trails behind or the other way round that causes a broadening of pulses. And all that happens 
because remember we are working with a multi mode laser remember longitudinal modes that we talked about lots of modes are actually here what is done is before introduction of the ultra short pulse into the cavity of the second laser which is called an amplifier it is made incident on a couple of prisms or a couple of gratings which disperse the light and we introduce chirp intentionally you make red light go forward blue light trail behind so what you do is you expand the pulse from uh, say 50 frame per second or 25 frame per second to whatever it is you make the pulse wide you make it a 20 picosecond or 2 picosecond or something broad pulse so then uh, the energy that would have been incident on the optics in 20 frame per second gets spread over maybe 10 times or 20 times or 100 times that time so that's why it is not so hard on the optics then it gets amplified comes out the problem is the output is also chopped but you don't want it then you use a compressor again another pair of gratings in a, a different orientation which compensate for the chart that you had introduced right so while stretching the pulse you make different frequencies uh, travel different path let's say you have given a smaller uh, path length for red larger path length for blue in the compressor after ex the pulse has been amplified in the compressor you do exactly the opposite you give now a longer path length for red a shorter path length for blue and then that spread that had taken place that is offset and they come together so once again you have an ultra short pulse the difference is the amplitude has increased from what it was by several orders of magnitude in the laser that we use we get uh, from nanojoule to millijoule right so uh, that's what happens here so uh, one thing i forgot to say is that in q switch lasers the energy that you get is uh, the power that you get is something like petawatt sometimes if you want you can get petawatt what is the meaning of peta we are very good with femto nano micro giga what is giga giga is 10 to the power what is six giga is nine then after giga tera that is 10 to the power 12 peta 10 to the power 15 not minus 15 the other way around so you get petawatt output if you use a, i mean you can get you don't always get petawatt lasers using your uh, q switch but the thing is the giant pulses very wide here you pack all the energy in uh, a small time so you actually you, you have seen what kind of uh, energies per pulse power per pulse you can get so that is what we are going to take up in the next module